Retail and Library Success Manager here at Edelweiss by Above the Tree Line. Um, I have the honor of hosting today's Editor's Pick Session where the featured publishers will be sharing some of the women's fiction titles they are proud to be publishing. Um, we are recording today's session and will share the recording along with the community list of today's featured titles. If you're not familiar, Edelweiss Community is a mobile-friendly social networking platform for book lovers. Here, users can join unique communities or groups of readers with similar interests. Oops, I'm skipping slides too fast. Um, members of a community can collaborate on lists of titles, communicate with one another, and share their reviews and collections. You'll see a link in the chat that gives a bit more information about community and how you can get yourself set up with a free account if you don't already have one. If you have any questions for our panel at any time, feel free to enter them in the Q&A section. If we don't get to them today, um, we will reach out to you directly afterwards. Uh, all presenters will be here and remaining in the webinar room until the end of the presentation, so they should be able to get to your questions. But like we said, if they can't, um, we'll make sure to follow up with you after the event. Um, so quick note, all publisher proceeds from this session go to support the work of Edelweiss Ascend, our initiative to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and sustainability in our publishing industry, as well as the tech industry. This driving mission underlines all the work that we do as a company, and Edelweiss Ascend in particular accomplishes this goal through investing in organizations, doing great work, providing access to intern internships and scholarships, and amplifying marginalized voices. So thank you to the publishers for participating and making this po possible. Um, today's session or theme is near and dear to me personally because without books, um, I wouldn't have been able to form so many thoughts and beliefs around my identity as a Black queer woman. Not only um, have books also, uh, not only have books provided me the tools to be able to fully form ideas and practices that challenge the normalcy of sexism and the toxic nature of our patriarchal culture, uh, but whenever I'm feeling confused or perhaps even a bit hopeless, I know we can turn to books to inspire, energize, teach, and help us ask the right questions. So of course, get excited to hear about these titles and add them to your list, but also prepare to be shaped and changed once you begin to read any of these. Um, okay, uh, so we are going to hear today about an amazing collection of books, 18 to be exact. What you'll notice is that a number of these titles aren't traditionally categorized as women's fiction, but each of these titles explore various aspects of womanhood. Some written by women, others for women, each of today's titles explore family, internal healing, living freely, fighting the patriarchy, exploring identity, and so many more themes that are relevant to the lives of women. Not one of these books are like another on this list, and they are set across the country and globe. So get excited because whether you're a bookseller, librarian, reviewer, or just a passionate reader, you're definitely going to leave with some more books on your to be read list. And don't worry, we'll send out links to all these books so you can learn more after this session. Many of the books featured today have review copies available, so be sure to check these titles out in Edelweiss once uh, we're done today. So, this is kind of our run of show today in the lineup of publishers we have ready to talk with you all. Uh, we ask our publishers to suggest their favorite picks for books that inspire us to respect and celebrate women, but also inspire us to pick up a great read, to give to a woman you love, to enjoy, escape, and be inspired as well. Of those sub submissions, our editor's picks committee selected the most interesting, the most unique, and the most powerful titles for today. We have rep representatives from 11 publishers, uh, and they'll each take just a few minutes to share why they're so excited about their book. Across these publishers, you'll see some romance, historical fiction, short stories, 
translated fiction, and much more. So finally, it's time for me to stop talking. Um, and I'm going to turn our metaphorical mic over to Valerie Pierce, who is the Director of Retail Marketing and Creative Services at uh, Sourcebooks. Um, and she'll be talking about two forthcoming titles from Sour Sourcebooks. The first is a novel that explores media, sisterhood, and dream chasing. Um, and the second takes a look at the messiness of family relationships and moving forward. I wanted to share a quick note from the author Iman Har Hariri uh, Kia that I feel really captures the importance of representation and recognizing women's fiction. So she says, uh, I grew up like most first generation children without a foot into with a foot in two worlds. Not Western enough to be considered fully American, not Middle Eastern enough to be considered fully Iranian. Unable to speak candidly with my parents about my experience, I sought solace between the glossy pages of Big Sister magazines. These publications dragged me out of my isolation and gave me a sense of belonging. So I resolved to one day become a writer and give back to a community that gave so much to me. So I will turn it over to Valerie and she can um, get you all excited for these amazing books. Thank you so much, Deidre. I am so thrilled to be with everyone here today. I'm so excited about the two big books I get to talk to you guys about. I have to say one of the biggest tragedies about working at a publishing house is that we read all these books really early and then we have to sit and wait because we can't book talk about them right away. So again, thank you so much to Edelweiss and everyone on the team for making it, uh, this opportunity available to all of us. So uh, as Deidre mentioned, this is 100 Other Girls, which is the bold type meets the devil wears Prada. I was gonna actually mention some of the stuff that Iman had recently said. So thank you Deidre for, for saying that for me. Um, but again, a little bit more about the backstory of the author. Uh, she worked in media and she worked in publishing. She worked at places like Bustle and Teen Vogue. And she actually watched Teen Vogue go from a print publication to going completely digital. She watched tons of her friends lose their jobs and she watched all of these different dynamics happen. So that paired with her, her upbringing of really using these big sister magazines to form connections to the world, these were the experiences that really formed the, the basis of 100 Other Girls, uh, which is a book that asked the question, how far would you go to keep the job that a hundred other girls are ready to take? Uh, in this book, when Nora, a Middle Eastern American aspiring writer, amateur blogger, and recent NYU grad has the opportunity to work for Vinyl Magazine, as the assistant to the iconic editor-in-chief, Loretta James, she jumps at the once-in-a-lifetime chance. The magazine practically raised her, and this is the perfect first step toward her dream career. But it quickly becomes clear that there's a darker side to the magazine's glitz and glam. The old school elitist print team and the woke for the wrong reasons digital team are at war with each other, sabotaging one another's content, poaching talent, and exposing secrets. As both sides attempt to use her as a spy in their corporate warfare, Nora must also juggle the relentless demands of her job with her own goals, all while navigating a tentative new friendship with a brilliant editor, a fallout with her sister, and an ill-advised, very spicy attraction to the hot IT guy. So this is a true coming of age story for women in their 20s. It's so fabulous. If any of you have had the chance to see Aman talk, if this is her debut, she's absolutely lovely. We will be touring her if anyone is interested in in-person tours or if you're interested in having her join you virtually. She's so absolutely brilliant. Every time I talk to her, I leave and just feel so inspired and I just want to read so much more. We have another book coming from her. You have to read this one first. And I hope all of your digital DRC requests fingers are ready to make sure that you request this book right away from Edelweiss. We'll move on to my next book. This is another debut. We really love to build debuts at Sourcebooks. For those of you who aren't familiar with our company, we're the largest woman-owned independent publisher in the country, and telling stories about women by women is incredibly important to us. Uh, this is A Very Typical Family from Sierra Godfrey. This is one of those books where the author perfectly describes everything that the main character is feeling, so much so that you as the reader feel as if it's happening to you. For example, when the story starts out, Natalie, our main character, thinks that her company is about to publicly announce that she's getting the promotion that she's been chasing for the last several years. People are already congratulating her before the official announcement. 
And then the CEO announces that Natalie's boyfriend, Paul, who's only been with the company for a few months, is the one getting that corner office job. Sierra Godfrey's masterful storytelling will have you feeling tears stinging in your sinuses, just like Natalie does. You feel the uncomfortable embarrassment that Natalie lives through as she sits at her desk for the rest of the day, watching as her boyfriend signs all of his promotion paperwork, and as she racks her brain, trying to figure out what she did or didn't do that prevented her from receiving the job she wanted. And that's just the beginning of Natalie's day, unfortunately. She finds out later that evening that her estranged mother has passed away and that Natalie must return home with her siblings in order to claim their dubious inheritance, a dilapidated Victorian mansion on the coast of Santa Cruz that happens to be worth millions of dollars. There's just one problem. Natalie hasn't seen her brother and sister in 15 years since she accidentally sent them to prison. Are you wondering what lovely Natalie did to send her siblings away? Well, the author will keep you waiting with a bit of anticipation throughout the story. So you better download that DRC right away to find out and then email me so we can talk all about it. A Very Typical Family is perfect for fans of Emma Straub and Jennifer Weiner. The totally off the rails premise is grounded by relatable commentary on family dynamics, making it the perfect book club pick. And a love story runs parallel to the family drama, adding depth and vibrancy to Natalie's journey. At its heart, A Very Typical Family is a darkly funny, heartfelt story about learning to love and forgive your family, even when they put you behind bars. This book comes out in September. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm going to pass it off to the next publisher. Thank you, Valerie. I love both of those titles, and I'm very excited. Also, I have to uh, point out that everyone could see my presentation view, but that's okay. I hope it's better now, and everyone can just laugh at me later, because I clearly don't know how to Zoom after two years of a, three years of a pandemic now. Two, three years? Who knows? What is time? Um, okay. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kimberly Carlton, uh, who is the acquisition, who is a an acquisitions editor at Harper Muse. Um, Kimberly will also be discussing two forthcoming titles out this summer that will uh, be perfect for you or your shelves. Uh, the first is a beautiful historical fiction um, novel that depicts a love story. It will hold on to your heart long after you turn the last page. And then the second is in a heartwarming ode to booksellers that I can already tell will become a staple title for bookstores across the country. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly. Thanks so much, Deidre. Also, no judgment on Zoom. Uh, it's a constant struggle. Um, hey, everybody. Like Deidre said, um, I acquire fiction for Harper Muse. Muse is a newer imprint, and we focus exclusively on adult fiction in the categories of historical fiction, women's fiction, as we're talking about today, and Southern fiction. And so I'm so thrilled to be talking with you today about two of our upcoming books that are truly so close to my heart. Um, the, Light, the Light Always Breaks by Angela Jackson Brown and Bookish People by Susan Cole. Angela in The Light Always Breaks, she writes historical women's fiction and she had a debut that we're super excited to keep building the momentum on. The setting for this story is Washington DC in the aftermath of World War II. The story follows the journey of two characters. Ava is a self-confident young businesswoman who has opened one of DC's most successful black owned restaurants, No Small Feet in 1948. Cortland is a young white man from Parsons, Georgia pretty much the middle of nowhere, Georgia. And he's in DC, he's devoted his life to politics there after returning from war, largely due to the ambition of his father. When Ava and Cortland cross paths, they have immediate chemistry, but a relationship between a black woman and a white man is illegal. And both Ava and Cortland have to decide first if they're in love and second, what that love would actually be worth to them. Their relationship has the potential to unravel their lives, creating scandal, mayhem, and even danger. As a, as a light, gentle spoiler, I won't spoil the whole thing, but you should know, this really isn't a story with your cookie cutter happily ever after. Angela has written a novel that doesn't shy away from the injustice of the world and the heartbreak that that can cause, but she's also managed to tell a story of hope and resilience and the beauty and the light that can come from the darkest of nights. The result is an unforgettable journey and a tragic love story. Angela has crafted these characters with such care and attention to historical detail, and it really shines through. 
This story is perfect for fans of An American Marriage any, and any books by Jasmine Ward. Um, and I'm really excited for you to read it for yourselves. And for this next story, uh, we're actually staying in Washington, D.C., but we're shifting in both time period and tone in case the covers didn't clue you into that. Um, I'm so excited to be talking with you about Susan Cole's upcoming novel. Bookish People is contemporary women's fiction. Susan writes from her experiences in the literary world, both as a longtime author herself and as a bookstore employee at Politics and Prose, one of the most prominent indie bookstores in DC. This story, like I said, is set there. Um, that's where Susan still lives and works. And she's well connected in the literary world, both with authors and booksellers. So she's definitely peeked behind the curtain in pretty much every way and has plenty to draw from to write this, set, th this humorous story. So for bookish people, think of a mix between Gail Honeyman's Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine and Britt Marie was here by Frederick Bachman, but with tons of books and bookish references thrown in there. This story is perfect for anyone who's a fan of books, which is all of us, I know, bookstores, stories about women, intergenerational novels, contemporary literature, and humorous writing. This story hooked me immediately. Susan has written a screwball comedy that actually made me laugh out loud, which is not something many books do for me. Not only is the plot engaging, but her writing voice is just distinctive and witty and even strikingly poetic at times. Bookish People centers on an independent bookstore, its owner, Sophie, in her 50s, who has recently lost her husband, and one of Sophie's employees, Clemmy, a young aspiring writer and accidental tortoise owner. She bought the tortoise trying to impress a boy, and she's about to meet her birth father for the first time. All of the action takes place over one week, so it's very tightly plotted, with both women coming to terms with grief that they felt stuck in for a really long time. Amid one-liners that catch you off guard and make you laugh, Susan has written a story about stories, the ones we sell to others, the ones we tell to ourselves, and the everyday, everyday drama of how we become who we are. Endorsers include everyone from Sarah Pekinen to Angie Kim. Um, Susan has brought both heart and humor to this book, and I'm incredibly honored to have been part of bringing this story into the world. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, and if you have any questions about these stories, or if you just want to get excited about them with me, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, I'm excited for both of those, but personally excited for bookish people as the former bookseller and a lover of all things turtle. So um, this is just really speaking to my soul right now. There will be plenty for you to relate to, I would imagine. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. Um, so thank you. And now... Uh, we are going to um, kind of jump over into some translated fiction, which is coming from World Edition. So I have Karen Wessel here, who is the Director of Business Development, Sales and PR at World Edition. Um, today we have one forthcoming and one already released title from World Editions. And what excited me most, most about these is that both of the titles uh, that Karen will talk about today are translated, one from the knees and other, the other from the Czech. Um, we have one story that powerfully highlights the reality of navigating trauma and finding hope, the other a critical look at gender norms. So with that, I'll turn it over to Karen and, and she'll talk more about her books. Yes, thank you, Deirdre, and hello, everybody. Uh, before I plunge into our two editors' picks of today, I wanted to say a very quick word about our publishing house. Uh, World Editions is still a fairly young publishing company uh, focused on, uh, like Deirdre said, literature and translation. And we only started publishing in the U.S. in the fall of 2018, so three and a half years ago. And while I was looking at our uh, publishing program this morning, I calculated that 88% of our now 77 titles are translations, that our authors are from 29 different countries, and that a nice 61% of our authors are female. And uh, like Deirdre said, our translations today are from the Czech and from the Japanese. And I'm going to start with Solo Dance, uh, beautifully translated by Arthur Reggie Morris from the Japanese. This is a debut novel. And uh, it was the winner of the very prestigious Japanese Gunzo New Writers Prize for Excellence, 
the same prize also won by Haruki Murakami and which marked the beginning of his splendid literary career. So we're hoping to reach the same for uh, Lee Kutomi. Solo Dance also received the Japanese Minister of Education Award for Fine Arts, another very important prize for new writers in Japan. Ikotomi is actually bilingual, Japanese, Chinese, because she was born in Taiwan, but moved to Japan when she was 23, and she writes in Japanese. Uh, solo dance offers a very important queer literary uh, voice to, uh, to our list uh, from East Asia's millennial generation. Uh, it will appeal not only to the LGBT plus community of readers, uh, but also to uh, uh, lovers of women's fiction overall, and specifically to younger women and all those who have an interest in Asia, because also aspects of both Japanese and Taiwanese um, culture are the backdrop of this book. Uh, Solo Dance is a very intense novel uh, about the painful coming of age of a gay person in Taiwan and then next in corporate Japan, uh, where the main character, uh, Cho Nori, is forced to keep her gay life hidden. Uh, the book deals with uh, dark and hard-hitting themes such as rape, homophobia and suicidal tendencies, but it is all done in a very beautiful and tender way. Um, the themes will appeal, of course, particularly to the LGBT plus readers and especially to young people who are looking to define or also to not define their uh, sexual identity. And Kotomi's beautiful transparent language uh, makes this book very accessible to uh, a very wide audience. Then we can move to the next title, The Movement from, yes, there it is, from Petra Hulova. Uh, this was just published a few months ago in October and also beautifully translated by Alex Zucker. Uh, Petra Hulova, some of you may know her already. She's a very popular Czech writer and playwright and a winner of several literary awards, and her books have been published in 13 languages. Um, it is a wonderfully outrageous feminist dystopian novel and a critical satire on sexual norms and gender equality. It's a story that takes place in the near future when radical feminism takes over society and becomes mainstream. It is provocative and serious and also fun at the same time. Uh, it is a sort of a, a feminist brave new world in which it is forbidden to be attracted to a woman on the basis of her body and appearances. And most males in this world have learned how to change their attitudes, uh, but still 10% of them uh, don't and they illegally enjoy pornography and uh, won't accept the new ideology. So these people are interned in institutions to be re-educated. And that's where the story of this movement takes place. That's the setting. And what I perhaps uh, enjoyed the most about this novel, besides the excellent literary quality that is really remarkable in this one, is that unlike many uh, dystopias, it is not told from the perspective of an oppressed outsider or rebel, but by a representative of the, of the system, in this case, of the winning majority of extreme radicals. And uh, there's actually a lot of ambiguity in, in the narrative voice. And as a reader, you become uh, nicely uncomfortable uh, with that, or I did anyway. And um, what I also loved about this novel is the hilarious sense of humor and the fact that it mixes satire with and fun with a very serious and important discussion about sexual norms. And probably because of this edgy mixture, uh, Hulova has been hailed by radical feminists in some countries, and but also criticized by radical feminists in other countries. So that's very interesting. Thank you for listening and good luck to the next. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. Thank you for, for sharing um, details about these titles, but also world editions. Um, and I know that there are several of us, especially booksellers who are like excited to get behind more translated fiction um, and make sure that more folks are reading it. And both of these titles sound amazing. So I can't wait to read both of them. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, so next we have uh, Jane Nutter, who is uh, the Communications and Marketing Manager at Kensington Books. Um, first, Jane will be highlighting a title that wouldn't normally be seen as a women's fiction because of the rigid nature of the genre. We decided to challenge that notion by acknowledging that women's fiction doesn't only speak to who's starring or who is writing the story. It is also recognizing the stories that allow us to feel more connected and to envision a new world with new possibilities for us all. So today, to, so today, Jane will be showcasing some queer fiction that we felt were absolutely aligned with the overall Ascend mission and also challenged us to rethink what we know and understand to be women's fiction. A great quote that um, I really, really loved uh, from the author, and I'm sorry if I'm doing this again, if Jane, you were planning on talking and sharing this quote yourself, um, but at the end, um, Matt uh, shares, I sincerely hope the secret life of Al Albert and Twistle makes its readers feel good about themselves and the part they played in bringing about this extraordinary social shift um, around accepting and centering queer voices. So with that, I will pass it over to Jane uh, and she'll talk about our next two picks. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Um, I'm Jane Nutter, a Marketing and Communications Manager with Kensington Books, and I am really excited to present today these two amazing uh, queer own voices debuts to you. Um, first up, we have The Secret Life, Life of Albert and Twistle by Matt Cain. Um, think of it as like the gunkle with the sense of humor and the heart and also the man called Uva um, in, the, in the way that it goes in depth into the characters um, because Albert and Twistle is a, uh, a charming feel good story about a shy closeted 65 year old postman living in the North of England. And he learns throughout the course of this book that it's never too late to start living your truth. So in the UK, they have forced retirement um, at a certain age. So when he's forced to retire, when he turns 65 years old, Albert is left adrift without the job that is provided routine in his life. Um, you know, he grew up in a time where being out as a gay man was not permissible in UK society. So he's just sort of really clung onto his job as his identity. Um, and he's really only got his, his cat, Gracie, to keep him company. Um, so when he's forced to retire, he's like, I have to change my life somehow. So to kick himself out of his rut, he decides to put himself out there and attempt to track down a long lost love from his past for whom he still holds a torch. The book overall is a celebration of human connection, self-acceptance, and the importance of having a supportive community as he sets out on an unforgettable and completely life-affirming adventure. An adventure shared with an endearing cast of well-developed, diverse characters. And, you know, Gracie is not just a side kind of cat. She's a really, really sassy character in her own right. Um, this novel uh, was actually inspired by Matt, Cain, Matt Cain's husband, Harry's own journey um, to coming out because he didn't come out of the closet until the age of 44. Um, so Matt really took that experience and, and made it into this novel. Um, Matt Kane is a former pop culture journalist, having been Channel 4's first culture editor in the UK, and is a leading commentator on LGBTQ plus issues in the UK. This will be his debut in the US. He has written a few other novels in the UK, but they've never been released here in the US before. Um, so we are treating him as a debut here. Um, this novel was very well received when it was published in the UK last summer, and it got even a rave review from Sir Ian McKellen, which is amazing. Um, this book is really great for book club discussions. It has a reading group guide included. And with his journalistic background, Matt is a dynamic and engaging speaker. He's so charming and funny and amazing. I mean, I could listen to him talk for hours. Um, he would be an ideal guest for any virtual programming that you have going on during Pride Month that you might be planning. Um, he is, he's ready to go and he is amazing. He'd be an amazing addition to any programming you have. Um, the, Secret Albert, uh, the Secret Life of Albert at Witzel is out on May 31st, so just in time for Pride. Um, and it's such a feel-good, amazing story. I really hope you all start requesting it. it. We also have really fun. We have pins that we made, um, exclusive pins that um, feature the book art. Um, so we have those available too. Um, I'll put all this information in the chat later, but they're also really fun. So if you have an art, we also send these really cute little exclusive pins. Um, and then coming up next, we have 
In the Event of Love by Courtney Kay. Courtney Kay is also a debut author. This is her true debut. She's never written a novel before. And In the Event of Love offers a steamy, sapphic queer spin on the feel-good tropes of, of a Hallmark Christmas movie in a sweet, funny rom-com that is perfect for fans of Casey and Kristen, Alexandria Bellaflor, and Alison Cochran. Courtney herself is bisexual, and she was really frustrated with the lack of bi-visibility that she was seeing in media. She longed to see her own identity represented, but most especially in a holiday rom-com. So she decided, hey, she was just going to write that story herself. Set in the small fictional California mountain town of Fern Falls, In the Event of Love is a second chance at love story between an overworked event planner, Morgan Ross, and tree farm owner, Rachel Reed, who as teenagers were close friends, but who also nurtured crushes on each other. When Morgan returns to full to Fern Falls to plan a small Christmas fundraiser. Her only goal is to rehab her floundering career and reputation because she was involved in a tabloid scandal involving a celebrity client that kind of got her canceled on Twitter. But working closely with Rachel for the fundraiser, it's stirring up all sorts of old feelings, making it harder for her to keep her eye on her goal. But she is determined that she and Rachel will absolutely not have their happily ever after holiday season. But I mean, I think we all know how that's really going to turn out, right? This book is a cozy hug. It is a cup of cocoa. It is a warm sweater that you want to slip on, slip on again and again. It's everything you could possibly want in a sapphic romance, but with the added bonus of like cozy Christmas feelings. This book has already gotten tons of advanced rave reviews from authors like Helen Huang, Ali Hazelwood, Ashley Herring Blake, Mara Wisner, Lana Harper, Alison Cochran, Rosie Dannon, Rachel Lynn Solomon, and I, I could go on and on. There's a lot more. Courtney is very connected in the romance world for a debut author, and we expect a lot of outpouring of support and cross-promotion from her fellow authors working in the space around a uh, release date. And so far, this has been uh, one of our most requested books from bookstagrammers and book talkers looking to promote on their own. BuzzFeed also named this uh, one of the most anticipated LGBTQ plus romance novels for 2022, which is amazing. And um, this, for bonus material, this will also have a reading group guide in it and an author letter as well. A second book in the Fernfall series will follow next year, so we're going to continue this on. Courtney is so lovely and well-spoken and passionate. She lives in the LA area. We plan on doing a lot of events um, in this space. And so if anyone's interested in talking to Courtney as well, we plan on doing in-conversation style events with her with other authors. Um, I'll put my email in the chat, but if any of you want to connect with me about either of these books for physical galleys or pins, um, please reach out to me um, at jnutter at kensingtonbooks.com. Both of these books are available on Edelweiss and NetGalley right now as well for you to read. Thank you all so much for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, again, excited for both of those. I feel like the pandemic forced me to read more romance because I needed to stop weighing down my brain with such heavy stuff. Um, and it made me fall in love with the genre. Uh, kudos to Amanda Toronto from Word Bookstores, who is like probably the best romance bookseller I've ever met in my life. But um, yeah, so I will definitely be adding all of these to my list. Thank you. So next, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Seema Mahanian, who is a senior editor at Grand Central Publishing. Um, these next two titles uh, are two that I've had my eye on for quite some time now. The first is a debut novel centered around friendship and it unpacks all the joy and mess the messiness that can come along with love. Um, then we'll see a new title coming from Lisa Cross Smith that is an intimate exploration of love after betrayal. So with that, I'll bring Seema on and I will mute myself. Thanks so much, Deirdre, and hi, everyone. Very excited to talk to you about these two novels. Um, so first is These Impossible Things. And uh, I'm wondering if other people have ever had that feeling of you're living in this perfect moment and it feels like it could last forever, but you know it won't. And for me, many of those moments are spent with my best friends. And I found that the fierce friendship between women make for some of the greatest love stories and the kind of dream sisterhood that we often see in books and in movies and TVs uh, and TV. But when we think of iconic female friendship, I think sometimes that image defaults to an Im uh, defaults to four women, the sun shining off their pink skin, the breeze rippling through their fair hair. 
But Salma El Wadani's debut novel, These Impossible Things, really shifts this predominant narrative and captures the nostalgia, delight, and comfort of three Muslim women's best friendship. So Jenna, Malik, and Keith are in their mid-20s and their lives have been intertwined since childhood. Now it's the end of university and adulthood is just beginning. But one explosive night really changes everything for them. And over the next few years, life brings them new hurdles from marriages, jobs, moves to distant places, and they have to find this way back, their way back to each other. But when we think of Muslim women in fiction, it's office, often just the terrorist, the princess Jasmine trope, or the refugee. But in these impossible things, these characters are Muslim women we haven't really seen in the pages of books. They follow their desires, they have sex, they party, but they also pray five times a day. These, these are women of faith whose identities really make room for a life made of contradictions and of choices. And to quote another author who wrote about taboos, New York Times bestseller Ashley Ordrain, she writes, Salma El Wadani deftly reveals searing and poignant truths about the female experience, one so rarely confronted in fiction. So These Impossible Things is if Sally Rooney met Michaela Cole and together they wrote this examination of womanhood, of sex and cultural expectations with this voice that's very funny, it's biting, it's a little bit heartbreaking. And one of my favorite lines is, the real C word for white people is culture. And once it's mentioned, they compete to show their respect for it and their knowledge of it. And that is just an example of why lauded poet Irsa Daly Ward has called this novel moving, telling, glorious. So you'll be seeing a lot of Salma El Wadani in the coming months. She's already a star on the rise in the UK. She's a BBC broadcaster and she's about to make a huge splash in the US. And we have a very exciting campaign planned. So even if we all can't be spending a week away with our best friends this summer, at least we have these impossible things and the magical best friendship of this novel to keep us company. And then we have our next novel, Half Blown Rose. And I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in this, but after two years where so much has been put on hold, I'm very ready to let loose, to travel, meet new people, maybe fall in love with them and embark on this journey of self-discovery, if that's not too much to ask. But in the meantime, I have Half Blown Rose, which is the story of a woman named Vincent who moves to Paris after her husband's betrayal to spend a year apart from him and decide what she actually wants. She starts teaching at an art museum where she has this electric connection with a Timothy Chalamet-esque younger man romance sparks, and as Vincent's year in Paris runs short, she faces a life-changing decision. Um, beyond the love triangle that gives us this delicious dose of escapism, plus many sexy and tender moments, there are also meditations on art, creativity, travel, family, and changing relationships. It's a book that really defies easy description, although I'm not going to argue with Taylor Jenkins Reid, who calls it an utterly intoxicating love story, uh, intoxicating story of love, betrayal, and loyalty. Still, I think there's one line that comes to mind whenever I consider what the story really is about at its core. It's this quick moment where Vincent's friend describes her as a flaneuse. The more common usage is in the masculine form of flaneur, which is refers to a privileged man of leisure who strolls idly about town. But in its feminine form, the word takes on this subversive connotation, that of a woman enjoying the freedom that comes from inhabiting traditionally masculine public spaces. And to me, that's what Half Blown Rose is about, a woman daring to take up space, to live on her own terms and figure out who she wants to be. It's about Vincent's moment of transformation when she's heavy with potential and ready to fully bloom. So if you're familiar with Lisa Cross Smith, you'll know that she is also in her Half Blown Rose moment. So far, she's published two books with GCP, So We Can Glow and This Close to OK, which received award nominations, rave reviews, and praise from authors like Roxanne Gay and Raven Leilani. And this, this Close to OK was also a three-time book club pick, including Book of the Month, uh, Marie Claire, and Good Housekeeping. 
But with each book, Lisa's audience is growing and Half Blown Rose will be the book to break her out in a massive way. It's received blurbs from Disha Filia and Lily King, and it has all the makings of a summer sensation. So I hope you're going to be as eager as I am to escape to Paris in these pages and maybe fall in love. Um, and we hope you enjoy reading them both. Thank you so much, Seema. I feel like I'm already rooting for Vincent and I haven't even read the book yet. And I just like already want to know how this all plays out. So um, wonderful, wonderful selection. I'm also a fan of Lisa Cross Smith. So I can't wait to get into this one. Okay. Moving on. Um, so next we have Alessandra Bastagli. Uh, who is an editorial director at Astra House. Um, Alessandra is featuring um, a title that unpacks a theme that I just uh, can't seem to get enough of, which is mother-daughter relationships. Um, Thought-provoking and filled with suspense, this is a title uh, that will definitely fly off your shelf, so make sure you're paying attention. And with that, I'll pass it over to Alessandra. Thanks, Deirdre. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Alessandra Bastali, Editorial Director at Astro House. And since we're also um, relatively new, I figured I'd tell you a couple things. Um, our first books came out in early 2021 and we're now fully staffed and publishing around 20 titles a year. Um, around half of them are in translation. We're distributed by Penguin Random House. And if you're curious about us, you can see our full catalog on Edelweiss. Um, as an imprint, we seek out books that are authentic, present original thinking, challenge our assumptions and broaden and deepen our understanding of the world, which means that we often find ourselves signing authors who experience their subject deeply and personally and have a strong point of view and writers who represent multifaceted personal experiences and who can introduce readers to new perspectives about their everyday lives as well as the lives of others. In other words, we're, we're publishing books just for Deirdre because this is exactly what she was saying she was looking for. Um, and Bad Fruit uh, by Ella King is a book that does all these things that we're looking for and more. Um, when this novel came in on submission last year, it was kind of like that publishing cliche where I read it in one sitting, I couldn't put it down. And had I been writing the subway, which is what editors normally do when they're reading, I would have missed my stop. Mm -hmm. Um, but then something that was very 2021 happened, which is that our publicity director, who was sick with COVID at the time, emailed me at one in the morning saying, I can't stop reading this. It's so amazing. I'm obsessed. We have to buy it. And that's when I knew that this wasn't a cliche and that we had something truly special on our hands. Um, so Bad Fruit opens with 17-year-old Lily Clark. She comes home and she witnesses a, a huge fight between her Singaporean mother, whose name is May, and her English father, Charlie. She knows immediately that it's about the love poems her father had been secretly sending her sister-in-law. Pulling her distraught mother away, Lily does the only thing that can calm May down. She reapplies her makeup to erase how white she looks and prepares her mother a glass of perfectly spoiled orange juice. If the juice isn't properly spoiled, May will become even further enraged, which means that Lily must always taste it first to make sure it's just right. Over the course of the summer, Lily's mother becomes increasingly volatile and unhinged, including in public, because unlike May's previous violent outbursts, which are mostly confined to home, Charlie's betrayal sets in motion an un unraveling that was a long time coming and that can no longer be contained. Lily starts having these terrifying flashbacks and suddenly she realizes that these aren't her own memories, but these are events from May's traumatic childhood in Singapore. And in time, enlisting the help of several strangers, Lily finally uncovers the details of the harrowing history that always cast a long shadow on her family. And in the process, she also reveals her mother's huge shattering secret. And that's what finally releases Lily from May's spell. So Ella King has written a compulsively plot-driven literary debut, but Bad Fruit is also a profoundly moving reflection on intergenerational trauma and the race to break its devastating cycle. King, herself the daughter of Singaporean immigrants, is raising a biracial daughter in Greenwich where the novel is set. For years, she has volunteered at a legal clinic for victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. In writing this book, she was also inspired by the stories her grandmother shared about the violence she witnessed when Singapore fell to the Japanese empire in World War II. 
So what King describes in these pages about trauma and selective amnesia is based on the real life experiences of women. What emerges from this singular combination of propulsive writing and lived experience is a deeply unsettling and utterly authentic portrayal of toxic mother-daughter relationship and of a young woman's search for redemption. Fans of Celeste Ng's Everything I Never Told You and Emma Donahue's Room will love this book and urge their friends to read it too. Please do dip into the e-galley, which is available on Edelweiss, and I promise that once you start, you won't be able to stop reading about Lily and May. Thanks, everyone. I think we froze for a minute. Did we lose Deidre? It seems like it also says Yeah, that I think we lost. Um, we lost our host. Yes. He was so dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> I broke the internet, guys. It feels like a women's fiction novel, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the beginning of one. You know, there's an, I just, while well, I have you guys, I'm gonna take advantage. Um, but there's another novel that we're publishing later in the summer, which is in translation called um, Dogs of Summer by Andrea Breu. And it's this wonderful sort of queer coming of age of two girlfriends growing, um, growing up in the Canary Islands and it's sort of the Y2K years. Um, and it's sort of, you know, a reminder of girlhood and how so often our first experiences of love and sex is with our best friend. And it's uh, really interesting because the, the translation so well done, she sort of kept the rhythms of Canary dialect um, in translating this novel and it's beautiful. And we're, we're the, the marketing campaign is incredible that we're setting up. So that's another one to look out for, but it's not till August. Just added that to my to be read pile you sold me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Do we know who the next person was? I know, I was going to say, who yeah, was after me? Yeah, it's me. Um, so if she's not oh, able here to jump back, back on, I can go ahead. Here oh, back. she's back. Okay. All right. Over to Elizabeth. All right. Are, were you going to share the screen, Deidre? Where? I'll see you in that spot. Is everyone um, hearing me and seeing my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I'm very sorry, everyone. No problem. There is a rainstorm happening, so I think it just kind of threw it off. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> sorry. Alessandra, were you able to finish? <laughs> talking because I cut yes, off. Yes, I also cheated and started talking about something else. So I totally misbehaved in your absence. I'm sorry. No, I that is not misbehaving. Myself. Did exactly what was needed to be done, which was keep the show moving. So <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to. Oh, no. Gosh, I think we might have lost her again, but I can go ahead and just keep, for the sake of time, I can keep um, going on here. Um, so I will introduce you to two uh, Tyndale fiction titles that I'm really excited to talk to you about today by two really wonderful um, women's fiction writers. Um, I'm Elizabeth Jackson. I'm one of the acquisitions editors on the fiction team here at Tyndale House Publishers. Um, so the first title that I want to talk to you about is called Walking in Tall Weeds. Um, Robin W. Pearson is the author. She may be a new name to many of you. Uh, she is an award-winning BIPOC author who writes Southern women's fiction. She 
she received a PW Publishers Weekly starred review for her debut novel, A Long Time Coming, which was um, published in 2020. Um, and then her follow-up novel, Till I Want No More, was also praised uh, for by Publishers Weekly, saying that Pearson's excellent characters and plotting capture the complexity and beauty of family, the difficulty of rectifying mistakes, and the healing that comes from honesty. Pearson rises to another level with this excellent story. Robin's third novel, Walking into All Weeds, introduces us to Paulette Baldwin as she finds herself wading through a new season of life. Paulette has always been determined that her son will want for nothing, least of all a mother's love and attention, which her own skin color cost her as a child. But all her striving leaves her husband Fred on the outside looking in, and now her son is grown and moved away. As Paulette's 50th birthday approaches, she suspects her husband and son are hiding a secret that could change the whole family. Soon she's facing a whirlwind she never saw coming and the three of them must dig deep to confront the truth. Maybe there they'll discover that their history is only skin deep while their faith takes them right to the heart of things. Um, this is just a really beautiful, beautifully written women's fiction novel by just a wonderful writer. Um, this would be a really great book for book clubs to discuss. There are discussion questions um, in the back of the novel as well. Um, and I think you'll just really fall in love with Robin's uh, writing and the story that she tells she's a very very gifted storyteller so I hope that you'll put this one on your uh, summer TBR list um, and dive into that one when it releases in July I think you'll really enjoy it um, and then the next novel I want to talk to you about today is Long Way Home. It's a historical fiction novel, novel by Lynn Austin. I'm hoping many of you may know Lynn Austin's name. She's been a writer um, for a long time. She's a very prolific author. She's published many uh, inspirational fiction novels, uh, I think 30 in total or, or counting. Um, and all total, they have sold more than one and a half million copies worldwide. Um, one of Lynn's books, Hidden Places, was made into a Hallmark Channel original movie. Reviewers have praised Austin's more recent novels. Um, in a star review of her last release, Chasing, Chasing Shadows, Publishers Weekly said Austin shines in this excellent tale of three women who struggle to survive World War II in the Netherlands. This is a must read for fans of World War II inspirationals. Her newest book is a timely... Uh, Oops, sorry, technical difficulties. Can you all still hear me? Oops. Um, yes. Okay, something's happening with my screen. I'll be, let me jump right back on here. Um, keep going. Um, sorry about that. You all disappeared briefly. Yeah, I can get it back up. Okay, can you still hear me okay? Yes. Can you all, yes. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Um, let me, let me get back to that. Okay. So Lynn's newest novel is called Long Way Home. Um, it's a story of courage, friendship, and faith that might appeal to fans of Susan Meissner's The Nature of Fragile Things or Kristen Hanna's The Four Winds. It's about a young woman searching for the truth her childhood best friend, a medic who served in the European theater, won't discuss after he returns from World War II, devastated almost beyond all recognition and help. She starts by contacting his war buddies, trying to identify the mysterious woman in the photo they find in Jimmy's belongings. Peggy and Jimmy's story is intertwined with the story of Gisela, who's <clears throat> which starts a few years earlier. Uh, Gisela is a Jewish refugee on board the passenger ship St. Louis bound for Havana, Cuba. When the ship is denied safe harbor by Cuba, Canada, and the US, nearly all 900 passengers are sent back to Europe to face the invading Nazis. Thus begins Gisela's perilous journey of exile and survival made possible only by the kindness and courage of a series of strangers that she meets along the way. Um, this also makes a really great pick for book clubs. There are discussion questions um, in the back of the book um, and just a really great historical fiction novel that you'll, I hope you'll also add to your TBR list. Um, it comes out in June and you can find it in bookstores, online, um, everywhere that you can find books. So I hope you'll really enjoy that one. It's a really wonderful story as well. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks for dealing with my technical difficulties right oh, no. during the presentation. No worries. Yeah, I had some of my own, so I can relate. Welcome to the internet. Um, but yes. All right, so I'm going to move us along here.
Uh, so next we have um, Helga Shire, um, who is a, an editorial director at CamCat Books. Um, and uh, Helga has two books to talk about today. So I'm going to pass it over to her. Thank you so much, Deirdre. Um, yes, CamCat is a woman owned publishing house of genre fiction. We burst on the scene with our first publication in June 2020 and have since published almost 50 titles. Sue Arroyo is our publisher and she picks books that provide an immersive reading experience, books that draw you in right away and won't let go, um, that invite you to walk in other people's shoes. And sometimes that can be a tense experience as with Joanna Elm's novel, Fool Her Once, that was just published on March 1. This book is very special to me. I've seen Fool Her Once grow from early drafts into a sophisticated domestic thriller. Domestic thrillers are among my favorite reads because to me, there is really nothing scarier than the thought that your home, the place where you're supposed to feel safe is anything but, and that the place most familiar to you is but a house of lies. Fool Her Once, uh, if you will, picks up where the HBO miniseries The Undoing, which was based on the novel you should have known, left off, and asks whether there is such a thing as a psychopath gene. Like Joanna Elm, the author herself, the protagonist of Fool Her Once, Jenna Sinclair, is a former investigative reporter who, when she began her career at a New York City tabloid, accidentally outed a serial killer's secret son. The outing has horrific effects on the young man's life. And then, and because of that, Jenna gives up her job and hides behind marriage and motherhood on the North Fork of uh, Long Island. <clears throat> For her once, picks up 20 years later. Jenna's marriage has hit a low point when her husband takes a lover and her teenage daughter resents her as teenagers tend to do. So Jenna moves back to New York to resurrect her career. When her editor is brutally assaulted, she's convinced that the man she outed decades earlier is after her, now that the new byline helped him find her. Her investigative instincts kick in and she sets out to find this man before he can get to her family. This setup sows the seeds for the rich themes that play into the story. The age old discussion whether nature or nurture defines who we are receives a new twist in the novel as it explores whether killers are born or made. Is there such a thing as a psychopath gene or is labeling someone as at risk for criminal tendencies a self fulfilling prophecy. What the novel asks are the responsibilities of tabloid journalism. Does the need to sell copies supersede the right to and respect for people's privacy. And underneath all that simmers the question as to how far a mother will go to protect her child. How far is she allowed to go? And quite frankly, how far are we as readers willing to follow her? I can tell you that the mother in Fool Her Once goes very, very far. And if you read this book, you're in for a suspenseful and thrilling ride. <clears throat> Roma Corden's Bewitching a Highlander, which will come out in June uh, 2022, um, is the next book I'd like to talk about. Um, if you like Outlander, and who doesn't, you like Roma Corden's Bewitching a Highlander, which is a fantasy romance set in 18th century Scotland. Bewitching a Highlander is a classic forbidden love story. Egan is of high status, while Brina, our heroine, is a low-born healer. Social status matters greatly, and so no matter how hard they try, they can't ignore this hurdle to their happiness. The reader is on their side from the get-go, rooting for them even before they are willing to go to bat for their love. The story begins when Brina learns that her parents didn't die in an accident, but that her father is still alive in a dungeon while her mother was executed for witchcraft. Yes. Brina is a witch, not a healer, as she claims, and she's on her way to rescue her father. That's when she meets Egan, who, intrigued by her spunk and her devotion as a daughter, quickly agrees to help her find her father. Against his own better judgment, mind you, because he's supposed to negotiate peace between two feuding clans, one of them holding Brina's father hostage. 
All that aside, what begins as a business relationship quickly turns into a romance. Trouble is, Brina can't tell Egan she's a witch because she doesn't want to burn at the stake. And Egan can't betray his own clan for a woman he barely knows and trusts even less. One of my favorite things about this novel is the setting. The novel was inspired by the author's trip to Scotland when she fell in love with a rugged and yet very beautiful countryside and what it does to the nature of the people there. Roma Corden also includes traditional lore of witchcraft and natural magic, which is our heroine's official trade as a healer. Historical facts, as well as actual laws and their repercussions are part of the very fabric of the story. One of these laws is the Witchcraft Act of 1735, an act abolishing witch hunts. But of course, as the story shows, even if laws are passed, it takes a while until people let go of their stereotypes and superstitions. Um, both of these books are excellent, excellent um, book club choices, and we offer um, book club, uh, sorry, we offer book club um, materials with lots of questions to start discussions uh, with. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and if you have any questions at all, please do reach out to me and I'll pop my email into the chat right now. <laughs> go. Uh, thank you so much, Helga. Uh, mm -hmm. It seemed like uh, just based off of feedback, a lot of folks are excited about these, so I'm sure you'll be hearing from folks. Uh, so moving along. Okay, here we go. We have Courtney Brock here, uh, who is a publicity manager. Um, the first a uh, title that she'll be talking about today is being published by um, uh, Bucknell University Press on uh, the second, Rutgers University Press, and uh, she'll be talking a bit about both of these. So I'll turn it over to you, Courtney. Yeah, um, so the first book I'll be talking about is Two Women, um, a novel. This is the Bucknell title by Gertrudis Gomez de Avenaleda. Uh, the book was originally published in 1842 in Spanish, and this is actually the very first English translation of Two Women. Uh, the author was a Cuban woman who was very much a legend in her own time. The book was considered so passionate and so boldly feminist in content when it was published that it didn't actually appear in her native Cuba until 70 years after it was first published in Spanish. The book follows a protagonist named Catalina, who, like her author, defies rigid social convention to forge her own identity and her destiny. The author herself is a pioneering feminist and anti-slavery activist, so she based the character of Catalina very much off of her own lived experiences. This is to say that the book is a striking example of early feminism, which is unique and very, very far ahead of its time. Um, as feminist ideologies were not so widely embraced in the Hispanic world in the 1840s. In addition to being a feminist text, it's also a great example of Cuban Spanish romanticism. And the author used the book as a vehicle to indict the stern laws that were governing and stern laws and customs that were governing marriage and women in the Hispanic world at the time of its publication. Uh, the second book I will be talking about, it actually it's two books together, um, Quicksand and Passing for Rutgers University Press by Nella Larson. I believe this is our uh, Rutgers best-selling book of all time. Um, some of you may know that Netflix recently adapted Passing, starring Tessa Thompson and Ruth Nega. I I'm sorry, can everyone still hear me? For some reason, my screen is frozen, so I, I can't see anyone. Yes, we can okay. hear you perfectly. Okay. Oh, and of course now my notes have disappeared. I'm sorry, I'm having technical issues. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to just go off not, not having the notes, see what, what I can remember. Um, Netflix recently adapted Passing. Uh, the author, Nella Larson, is one of several women writers who've largely been forgotten when folks talk about the Harlem Renaissance and the literature that came out of that. Um, despite having found success very early on. And, oh, okay, hold on, I'm back. Sorry if, if I cut out at all. Um, despite having found success very early on in her writing career, she garnered multiple awards for both of her novels, including the Guggenheim Award in 1930. They were well-received critically. She got praise from 
other authors, including W.E.B. Du Bois, who called Quicksand the, quote, best piece of fiction produced since the heyday of Chestnut. Despite this, despite getting early fame and recognition for her two books, she really isn't known today, um, which is unfortunate. And that's because she published, after these two books came out, these two novels came out, she published a short story titled Sanctuary. And she was like, accused of plagiarism. Uh, the claims didn't really have much foundation. It really wasn't proven. She really didn't plagiarize, but her literary career, unfortunately, never recovered. She faded into obscurity. She returned to her nursing job, um, her nine to five nursing job, and was a nurse until her death in 1964 and, and didn't write after that. And people, I think, thanks to the Netflix adaptation, I'm hoping that people will rediscover her um, and she will get the, the recognition that she deserves. That's pretty much it for me. Thank you so much, Courtney. And um, yes, I know that a lot of authors, contemporary writers today have been giving a lot of credit to Nella Larson and that's been really amazing to see. So, um, yeah, sorry. Um, so next we have pa Patrick Henry Bass, who is an executive editor at Amistad Books. Um, Patrick will be talking to us about a forthcoming collection of stories um, that is coming out from Lady Hubbard. So I'll give it to you, Patrick. Thank you, Deidre. Am I the only one who feels like we're in Mercury retrograde? Just asking. We anyway. must be. <laughs> something, something is going on. I believe so. Uh, uh, I'm Patrick Henry Bass. I'm executive editor at Amistad. And this year, we are celebrating our 35th anniversary as the oldest commercial African-American publisher. And today I'm thrilled to talk about The Last Suspicious Holdout. In her brilliant collection of 13 interlinked stories set in and around an unnamed Black community, all of Lady Hubbard's originality, rich imagination, and profound cultural insights are on full display. Spanning from 1992 to 2007, or roughly the beginning of Bill Clinton's election and the eve of Barack Obama's inauguration, the stories in The Last Suspicious Hold that represent a period during which the Black middle class expanded and there, were, there was the absurd notion of a post-Black or post-racial world while reports of welfare queens, crack babies, and super predators abounded in the media at the same time. The stories are dazzling. And for us cognates, we meet a young father who's formerly incarcerated who's struggling to raise tuition money to keep his troubled son in an elite private school. And there he go, a young girl whose mother moves constantly, clings to a picture of the grandfather she doesn't know, but events stories of his greatness. Characters spotlighted in one story reappear in another, providing a stunning testament to the enduring resilience of Black people as we navigate the world. <clears throat> as readers enter to each of the 13 stories, be prepared to laugh out loud, shed a tear, and to feel fully awakened. Lady Hubbard is a mul multiple award winning author who uh, just received the 2021 Berlin Prize for the Rip King, which Amistad published, and she is the 2022 Rad Radcliffe Fellow in Cambridge. The Last Suspicious Holdout is for readers uh, who like Jennifer Egan's A Visit from the Goon Squad, classics such as Winesburg, Ohio by Sherwood Anderson, and Tony K. Bombard's The Salt Eaters, and of course, anything by Toni Morrison, who taught Lady Hubbard creative writing at Princeton. The collection has already received enthusiastic praise from Roxane Gay, Mary Gateskill, and Alice Randall. Like her previous books, Lady Hubbard seeks to challenge and affirm our common humanity while she looks fearlessly and open-eyed into intentional barriers and societal inequity and its devastating impact on communities, most time for generations. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Patrick, um, and congrats to Abbasad for making it to 33 years. Um, so last but not least, uh, we have Michelle Herrera Mulligan, who is a senior editor at Atria Books. Um, she'll be talking about a book that actually is out today. So congratulations to you all and Reyna. Um, so I'll turn it over to you for you to talk about it. 
Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for staying with us, even though we've had a little bit of a rough ride, but I'm very, very excited genuinely to be presenting this book today. Um, I'm an executive editor at Atria Books. We've been around for a long time and we have a long track record of publishing both commercial and literary fiction and historical fiction. And on the eve of St. Patrick's Day, I couldn't be happier to be presenting A Ballad of Love and Glory. Um, what really excited me most about this title was the opportunity to dive into a beautiful untold story that exemplifies everything that I love about historical fiction. It's immersive, it's romantic, it's lyrical, and it lends vital perspective to the reality we're living today and how we got here. As the, noble, as the novel opens, the year is 1846. After the Republic of Texas becomes the 20th state in the Union, the disputed land between the Rio Grande and the Rio Nueces ignites the Mexican-American War. Under this backdrop, two star-crossed lovers emerge. One, John Riley, based on a real-life Irish immigrant who worked as a soldier for the Yankee Army near the Texas border. In case you're like me and you'd never heard of John, you'll be excited to find a Jamie Frazier level hero here. That's a shout out to Outlander fans. This is an honorable man who risks everything to travel across the globe just to find the means to feed his family. You'll watch him quickly become a leader of a troop of Irish soldiers who bond with him and pledge to support him, even as he watches everything he holds dear desecrated as the soldiers raid the Catholic churches and wreak havoc on the land that reminds him so much of his motherland. In one extraordinary moment, he risks his whole life. The means to provide for his family, the loyalty of the men he pledged to serve, to defect to the other side, joining the Mexican army as the leader of the real life St. Patrick's Brigade. Meanwhile, on the other side of the border, we hear the story of our heroine, Jimena Salome, an indigenous Tejana nurse who pledges to serve the Mexican army after her husband is murdered by the Texas Rangers. Jimena is headstrong, ambitious, and caring, drawing from the land she's lived on to heal her community. But despite her reservations about the war and the ugliness of the ambition it represents, she still vows to care for and comfort the soldiers fighting the Yankee invasion. If nothing else, her husband's sacrifice has to be worth something. Jimena and John meet and fall into a forbidden romance. And as the war races to its tragic end, readers will be at the edge of their seat. Will John and Jimena survive the carnage? Did John survive the carnage? There's so much interesting detail here that is meticulously researched. And in case you're unfamiliar with the extraordinary author, Reina Grande, 10 years ago, she published the extraordinary memoir, The Distance Between Us, which shares her own heart-wrenching trip across the border as a young undocumented girl, desperate to reunite with her parents. We're publishing the anniversary edition of that wonderful book this year. As a longtime fan of Reina's, I can tell you that this novel, her first in more than 10 years, is her most ambitious and emotionally evocative work to date. On a personal note, I can tell you it touched me deeply to see the border and all of its natural beauty come to life in Reina's prose. My own mother is from this very region and growing up, all I heard from her, from the news and every other portrayal was that it was a place to escape, a hub of violence, desperation and fear. But for me, on these pages, it was magical to see the border and Texas as a lush, rich landscape full of natural wonders and determined people it was incredible, most of all, to see this land portrayed as a place worth fighting for. If you love literary historic fiction like A Long Petal of the Sea, along with epic classics like Lonesome Dove and Cold Mountain, you will love this book. I sincerely hope you pick it up. And I should mention lastly that Reina has just kicked off her nationwide tour. She's visiting more than 20 bookstores around the country, so look out for her coming your way soon. So on behalf of Reina, I wish you all sincerely a happy St. Patrick's Day, or as they say in Mexico, Felicia de los San Patricios. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, first of all, thank you to the publishers and everyone who joined us and talked about these amazing titles. Um, I loved every single one of them. And as we said at the beginning, make sure you keep an eye out. We will be sharing the recording for this event along with a community list of all these titles. So you'll be able to see which ones still have digital review, review copies available. 
um, and just learn more about when they're coming out and how you can pre-order them. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us, for sticking this out, um, for, for still enjoying the event despite all my technical difficulties, even though I ran around the house and checked everything before starting, there will always be something that goes wrong. So thank you all. Um, thank you to the publishers again, um, and reach out to the publishers and also just hype these books up. They all deserve some love. So share them, talk about them, read them, and give them to someone else who will love them as well. Thank you. Bye.